Well, if the council really wants to bring jobs and tourism and build houses, what about the Wirral Water Scheme with all of their potential and the space for 13,000 new homes? And for Hoy Lake, we've heard all about a, a wildlife wetland centre, which we think is a fantastic alternative, with or without a golf resort. <laughs> needs is vision, leadership and innovation to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. So in conclusion, we believe this golf resort is the wrong development in the wrong place and it's a bad idea on so many levels. <coughs> there are better alternatives with better outcomes and this project shows a complete lack of vision when they have an opportunity to build a real legacy project. Costs are already spiraling, spiraling and they haven't even put a spade in the ground. The council should stop now before wasting any more taxpayers' money. Because once the green belt is gone, it's gone forever. very much indeed, a very powerful, uh, powerful presentation, I'm sure you'll agree. It's very nearly your time to ask some questions, but before we do that, I think it's only right that we give uh, Phil Davis, the leader of the council, an opportunity to say where the plans are up to at the present stage. Phil? Uh, okay, can, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, Phil, Phil Davis, leader of the council and local resident I live in West Kirby, so uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Margaret, and uh, great to see so many people here. Um, what, what I wanted to do is just give a few um, words in terms of an overview. Of what I'm gonna do is just say a few words by way of introduction, and then I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, David Ball, who's the lead officer from the council. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please, we did say at the very start, in respect to our speakers and in respect to the people in the audience, not to shout and heckle, because you're actually taking the time from the questions that we're going to hear. There are very strong views, but what we really want to do is hear the views from everyone, so please do not shout out. Show some respect for our speakers, please. So, uh, I just wanted to say, why, why are we looking at this proposition? So, we have uh, a proposition presented to us for a project which totals in ara around about £200 million worth of regeneration uh, for uh, this part of Wirral um, and the whole of the borough. The, um, the headlines that I think uh, we need to look at, at least seriously, are the, the potential of uh, attracting significant numbers of, of jobs to the area uh, and uh, spin-off jobs from those, um, those uh, opportunities. And, and secondly, the opportunity to generate significant additional uh, income for the local authority. And that's important for me because my uh, budget is being cut by about 130 million over the next four years. So the council needs to bring in new sources of income in order to fund vital public services going forward, children's services, libraries, leisure centres, because after 2021, the uh, main government grants uh, that we've been relying on for many, many years will stop completely. So if we don't replace that lost uh, uh, grant with new forms of income, then we won't be able to fund the public services that um, thousands of, of our residents rely on on a daily basis. So that's why at least we need to look at something like this seriously. And I think that the important point I wanted to make is, um, we've not made any decisions about this project yet. Um, let's... Oh. Oh, 
no decisions have been made around this project. We think it is a potentially um, uh, good project that we need to look at, but I absolutely accept that there is still a huge amount of detail to look at. So where, what, where we are at the moment, I'm going to ask David to um, give you more detail, is there's a report going to our cabinet on the 18th of December asking for authority to do a whole series of more detailed studies around many of the issues that you've, that we've been, uh, the, the, the previous speakers. Well, have you spent so much money? Yes. <laughs> Come on, guys. Let him speak, please. So the next stage is to commission, um, at no cost to the council, uh, a, whole, a whole range of further studies around uh, things like the, the, the issues we've heard about this morning, environmental impact, flood risk, economic benefit, traffic impact assessment, and so on. And we need to do all of those studies before we'll be in a position to say um, that this is a project that's worth pursuing and that it has both economic benefits and I absolutely accept that it protects uh, the local environment. And I don't necessarily believe that's an either or, but we need to, we need to do these studies before we get to a position where we say, yes, this all stacks up on all of these uh, levels, e economy, environment, and so on and so forth. And there will be, there will be further uh, public consultation um, as part of the next stage of, of, the, uh, of the work. And obviously, before any, any uh, uh, final plan goes ahead, it will have to go through the statutory planning process and the planning committee will have to make an assessment. So um, I, I kind of got the, the, the feeling this morning that there was a, there was a sense that um, we pressed the button and this is definitely, definitely going to happen and there's no opportunity to make any changes. That's not the case. We are still at the stage of understanding and, and, and working out how we could do this uh, uh, project that has those economic benefits but also protects the environment. So it is not the end of the, of, of the story at the moment. We've, we've still got, I think, at least another 12 months of, of work to get into a position that we can actually say, yes, this stacks up on all those different levels. So I think there's still, still further, um, further opportunity for debate and discussion. And, um, uh, just want to say a few few words about Mark's presentation. I'm very happy, Mark, to sit down with you and your colleagues to talk about the uh, the plan that you've uh, talked about this morning. And I think um, that the part of the next phase will be talking to all of the key players, including yourselves, to see if we can come up with a project that has that balance between preserving the environment that we 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 love and cherish. Uh, and as a local resident, I I agree with that but also saying, are there some economic benefits here uh, that our children or our grandchildren can benefit from? So that is absolutely part of the next phase of the, of the work. So, Colin, if I can hand over to David now to give um, the audience a bit more detail about where things are. <coughs> Thank you, Sam. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay at the back? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Um, what we've been doing over the last eight to nine months is um, receiving from the Nicholas Joint Venture Group their funding and phasing proposals for the delivery of the Hoy Lake Golf Resort project. We've asked them to provide that information to us up front so that we can look very carefully at it, make some assessment about who the partners are that would be involved in the scheme, what the funding would be for that, and our own internal colleagues and our consultants have now done a financial appraisal of that. On the basis of that, as Councillor Davis has said, we're taking a report to our Cabinet on the 18th of December, which is recommending that we move through to the next stage of this project. Not making any decisions at this moment in time, but enabling the Nicholas Joint Venture Group, at their cost, to undertake all of the technical studies uh, which have been referred to this morning. All of the questions that have been asked, all of the points that have been made are very valid. They all need to be looked at. At the moment, we don't have the answer to what those uh, questions are, and we don't know whether this is good or bad. We need to have that detailed consultant input to be able to see where we go. 
Now, I've already met with most of the statutory organisations and agencies that are interested in this project. I've met with a number of uh, residence groups and also some people who've raised a whole range of environmental concerns. And we will continue to do that at any time. All of the studies, when they report, will all be public and available so everybody can have a look at them. We will do further consultation when the outcome of those studies is known because until those studies have concluded, we don't know what the final design of the golf resort would actually look like because those studies need to inform that final detailed design. So at the moment, the map that was showed to you earlier is just an indicative proposal. Once the studies have been done, it may look different to that. So at the end of that period of time, we will do open public consultation on all of those things, and then the developer will go into the formal planning process where there is statutory public consultation. Those studies will take about 12 months to do. I think they're going to start in about February 2018. We'll go through to about February 2019. Planning application, if um, they're in that position to do that, would be around May, June, July of 2019 on the current uh, program that they've given us. So there's plenty of opportunity for people to comment, to be consulted. You can make all your representations on the studies, whether you're for or against uh, the resort, and all that will be open and transparent as we go through the process. So I hope that's just helpful to bring you up to date with where we are. Obviously, there's lots of questions that you may have. Happy to try and answer those um, around that. Okay. Right, thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's your turn. I'm going to try and do this a little bit like the David Dimbleby uh, fashion. So obviously, if you put your hands in the air, if you have a question to ask. And what we do, we'll also, don't forget, we've got Mark, Karen, as well as the council here to speak. So... Start with the lady here in the front. If you, if you just don't mind turning around and shouting Thank out your question. Give the microphone. <laughs> we will try, but that will be really difficult when we get to people at the back. Thanks for explaining about the Niklaus thing. We don't want Niklaus's firm to do these studies. They need to be done by independent. <laughs> Okay, the gentleman in the middle here. Yeah. Just a couple of points. Uh, uh, local golfer I spoke to. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll relay it. I'll relay local, it. For you. A local professional golfer down here states golfers would not want to come here because they want to go somewhere century like Liverpool, so they can spiral out to different courses. That makes total sense to them. So I think that's just a basic. The other thing, I've worked at local authority at a fairly decent level. And I've worked in countryside and recreation, outdoor space, all that sort of stuff. And I've seen how uh, these projects can come alight, and there's a process that you go through, and there's very, very, very cleverly worded surveys, etc. And the process will still lead to the end conclusion. And that's what I fear with this particular venture. There's been some very credible uh, debates and arguments here, and facts, which I think are very, uh, very genuine. If they're ignored, and if the leader of the council doesn't acknowledge the uh, what's been said today as a reasonable argument, then I think that's foolish. It could stop here. This would be some very good arguments stated. Quite continue. Okay, thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Just what I'm trying to do is encourage as many people to speak as prop as possible. But if you can ask just sort of one question at a time, it would make life so much better. We get everyone in. So, this gentleman over here on the side. I have introduced myself, I'm Andrew Gardner. I'm the Conservative candidate for the next May's election. I'd just like to make um, clear we've surveyed. Shout. We've surveyed half the ward. There's clear opposition to this plan as it stands. There is good points in it. However, the main thing that comes back, what you tell me, is we don't need another golf course. Yeah. 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 You might tolerate some housing, you might tolerate some housing. No! 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 No!
The lighter moustache to start with. <laughs> or the darker one. The thing about this is, you've already put a lot of money into it. You're, you're, you're putting more money into it. There was a, there was a slip before they said, it's not so much uh, how this is, it's not so much whether this is going to go ahead, it's how it's going to go ahead. Yeah. And the fear is, it's going to, there's going to be something that we don't want. It's not as though we've got the, we can have the, the state of things as they are now, right? It's not that at all. We know, I think, because there's that much invested in it now, that there's going to be something. It'll be clawed back to something. He won't be able to do all this grand, this, this, this vanity stuff, which is about the, the, the Mr. Davis's vanity. But what we're also concerned about is it's also being used as a Trojan horse to change the, uh, the, 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 the protections on our green belt. Yeah. 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 Build on green belts. Yes. Okay, so I what I'll do, I'll, what I'll do is I'll pass the microphone over and give the, give the council opportunity to respond to that. Um, okay, I'll I'll try and answer some of those. I'll try and answer some of those points, and and David's um, will will add to, to this as well. Um, I mean, I I just feel as leader of the council, we have a duty to at least look at this. No, 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 no. We do, we do. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Based on what? Based on objective, on, based on objective analysis of the pros and cons. Um, I think uh, not to do so. Given, given the potential economic benefits, would be, I think, a dereliction of my duty as leader of the council. Oh, and, yeah. also, and, and also, and also the, the prospect of significant additional revenue to the council's oh. coffers in order to keep libraries open, legislators open, oh, and okay. children's services. So I believe that I believe we do have a duty to at least. Uh, and um, look at the, the benefits, potential benefits. Um, I think it's, it's completely wrong to say that uh, this is all phase of complete and a decision has already, already been made. That is, with the greatest respect, that is just not, not the case. not to say that. Um, well, I think you did. So, um, well, this was, a, this was a proposal that was presented to us and we're examining it. Um, and there would be an opportunity, as David said, for, for um, everybody to look at the independent analysis, and I'll ask David to, to give you a bit more information about how these, how these studies will... Stop sulking, get on with it. Um, so, uh, the, um, so that I think the work does need to take place. All of the, the information needs to be in the public domain. It will be in the public domain. People will be able to examine it. And, uh, and that includes the information that we've received this morning. But you know, my plea is, let's at, look, let's at least look at this and look at the, the evidence, and then people can make up their minds before a decision is made. And I'll just, can I just ask David to uh, just add a bit more detail about the story? Let's have some questions. Okay. Right, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna, sorry, yeah, there's a lot of people asking questions. I, I will try and get as many of you as possible. The lady's standing up now with the scarf on. Watch, watch the audience. Is there anyone in the audience who actually supports? Who's <laughs> right. Perhaps you'd like to make a comment, sir. What relationship are they? Or I'm the only one who's prepared to stand up and say that I support it. I'm a Hoy Lake resident. I guess the first thing I'd like to do is to say a big thank you to Mark and the team at Hoy Lake Vision because. They make this place a whole lot better than it was, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. And much of, that, much of that is through just sheer hard work for no necessarily commercial return. In terms of the presentations today, well, let's talk about Hoylake first of all. I've, I am a Hoylake resident. I came back to the world 23 years ago. 
I'm very proud of Hoylake, but I also worry greatly about what the future holds for Hoylake. I walk down the high street and too many shops change hands too frequently. Like as a, it teeters, I think is probably the word that I would What's your use. Question? It's not a question, sorry, this is a statement. This is a statement, and please take this, and obviously there's a great deal of feeling in this room. But I think what we have to recognise is that we've seen two presentations today. The Hoylake Vision presentation was not saying, let's have this, but it was taking a very, very balanced view in terms of where we want to be and what we want to look at. So for my part, I want to see Hoylake and the greater part of Wirral be successful, be seen for what it is, which is a great place to live. And my money is on giving Hoylake Vision the opportunity to develop this conversation further. Because these guys are passionate about it. The evidence is already there. So I genuinely believe that we should be giving them a chance to do that. Thank you. There's the gentleman here who says we've got a gold uh, yeah, brochure in the air. Hello, good, good morning. I'm the local councillor for Hoylake, so I have an interest in this, a great interest. My name is Jerry Hills. Take the microphone, please, Jerry. My name, uh, I'm the local councillor for Hoylake. My name is Jerry Ellis. And I've got a particularly um, unique position here, because I'm the only person in this room who can actually vote against this in the council chamber. Because we're Phil will obviously get all of his uh, colleagues to vote in favour of this project. I've christened this Phil's Folly. <laughs> <laughs> because Phil is really the only person, apart from the gentleman in the corner, the only person in the holy thing, or in the world, that, that, that wants to go ahead with this. Ask Phil, you've been complaining today about, I'm going to ask you a question, you've been complaining today about all the cuts that you've had in your budget, and that is true. But then in that case, why are you wasting millions of pounds on this golf course? You've already wasted a million, and it's going to go on and on and on. Why, but just on a side why are you wasting a half a quarter of a million on a newspaper which you don't read? Yeah. Yeah. No, the only reason why we don't, he's shaking his head, the only reason why we don't read is it's because they don't deliver it to us. <laughs> so we would. Um, why, why are you wasting money on some of the other things, like all these high paid, I paid senior man. Can we go to a question, please? So the question is, Phil, that I'm, it's all a question. Why are you wasting all this other money? And then you come here today and belly ache about the fact that um, you haven't got enough money. Well, you could save a lot. My question is very simply this, Phil. Now that you've come here today and found out all this opposition in Hoyland, why are you going ahead with the scheme? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm, I'm uh, suggesting that we go to the next stage, which is to find out more um, uh, objective information about it, because I think, I think it would be uh, remiss if we didn't at least examine the opportunities uh, for this kind of scheme, and with, without any commitment at the moment till we see the evidence. And um, final point, Colin, is in response to Jerry. I, uh, actually, I won't have the final decision because it will be the planning committee that makes the final decision about any development. And, and in, in closing, I'll take no lectures from Jerry Ellis, whose government has decimated my budget over many years. So, another gentleman here just want to speak about the in support of the project. Yeah, uh, my name's Andy Snell, I'm a Holy Lake resident. Uh, I think it's important to say, I work for the Royal Chamber of Commerce, but I'm here as a Holy Lake resident, and I think Whilst there's a huge amount of passion and a lot of very valid arguments being presented uh, both from, from Mark and indeed the, uh, the Stop the Golf Resort campaign, I, I, I personally don't think the respect's been afforded to the council leader and his officers here today by some, by some very loud individuals with some of them which with, with no place to make, some of which. But what I would like to say is that over, over the years I've been in very similar rooms to this where I'm not criticising your, your, your uh, opinions or points of view or, or even opposition, but I've been in similar, view, similar rooms where a proposed extension of Liverpool Football Club Stadium or indeed Everton Football Club's relocation or development of Liverpool 1 
Development of Liverpool, one, I've, I've needed rooms with twice as many people as this, vehemently opposed to the Liverpool land developers. Okay, so I'm giving, a con I'm giving it context. That's in a city, it's not Greenbelt Green 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 Land. Okay, I'm giving it context. And the point I'm trying to make is, the development process that Phil Davis and, and, and his officers are going through is entirely uh, in fitting with what goes on the rest, rest of the country and indeed the world, they're exploring the economic benefit against the potential, against the potential environmental risk. They're commissioning uh, flood uh, surveys. You, this room here, there's been a lot of points made and the chairman asked for a couple of people in the room who are brave enough to say there might be another view in the world. Okay, that's all to make you. I just want to take a couple of questions from some younger members of the audience. Just to... I was looking at you. Also, the young man right behind you, who's had his hand up for a long time as well. Thank you. Hello, Give the young man I'll come back to you, I promise. And I'm just going to say, if the council's meant to be open to all ideas, how come it hasn't spent do you know, an equal amount of money looking at um, developments, um, say in Birkenhead dumps, which are brownfield sites, which are just like industrial yeah. 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 I, I know they talk about um, closed shops um, in Hoylake, but do you know, the amount of poverty on the, on the other side of the motorway is, is unbelievable and it's like um, a completely different world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you know, they, they still say they're being open, but um, to be honest, I think they're going to be saying that till the cement lorries come. Yes. Yeah. 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 Probably don't need the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I'm going to say here is the Labour Council today is going against Labour Party policy, and I'll give you a question. It's only a short piece to read out. What Phil Davis said in the Whittle Globe less than six months ago. I am not prepared to allow our Greenbelt land to be built on. I am resolute about that commitment. It is the jewel in Whittle's crown and greatly valued by our residents. Now this motion was passed at Labour Party conference this year. Uh, we know that Nicholas is a flawed joint venture group and this is what, what it said. Uh, and this was passed at Labour Party conference. Conference recognises that the private sector will not deliver a solution to the housing crisis. We therefore call upon Labour councils in areas where the need for social housing and teach supply to meet that need by ensuring a sustainable means of meeting their local housing need by retaining ownership and control of available public land and prohibiting both the transfer of that land to private developers and engagement with flawed joint venture groups. Yeah. Why is he involved in talks with a flawed joint venture group when his own party policy says he's not to do it? Okay. 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 I'll allow, obviously, let Phil Davis answer those questions, but I'll take a few more questions first. The microphone is somewhere. You're gentle, yes. Not a speech, please, sir. A, a no, question. just a few facts, there. No, no, no. Because no, no. I mean, we've got 15 minutes left. Sorry, very short. Very short. We've got 15 minutes short. left. And I want a lot of people. A few facts here in 2015 by the Office of National Statistics. Statistics. It's information regarding uh, county that have given land over to golf courses. I will give you the top four figures. The county of Middlesex has given 1.6% of its land to golf courses. Sorry, 2.65% of its land. West Midlands, 2.74% of its land. And top of the list, 
The most in England is Merseyside at 2.82% of its land given over to golf courses. It's, it's important to note that the proximity of these courses to urban areas is a factor. For example, Greater Manchester and Merseyside have all most identical population densities, but Merseyside has more than twice as much golf per square mile. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The lady in the blue and black had a hand up a long time. Perhaps you'd like to shout out, madam. Right, I've got quite a good carrying voice. You have? <laughs> I think it's very important that this issue is discussed at the Golf which is absolutely wonderful. I come to the cinema. I went to, not just to the talk tonight by Mark, but also the one in St. Luke's, which was very badly attended, and the Beacon meetings, which are quite badly attended. And I came here today with a totally open mind to make my mind up one way or the other. I haven't done that, but I do feel very intimidated. <laughs> The, the gentleman in the red anorak, sit him down, and then, then I'll come to you there, sorry. Chair, this lady's kept her hands up all the time and you haven't seen her. My apologies, uh, there's a lot of people with their hands up a long time, but I will, come, I will come to it, I will come to it. Sir, you first. Short question. We all know about the cuts which have been imposed on this council and all councils by the Conservative government. But what I can see in the plans for the Gulf Resort is how the present council what can see yourselves making a shed load of money from it? My apologies for getting Thank you. Uh, I, you want to continue? Uh, right, you want to continue examining your proposal. How can we ensure that the council would that also the Hoy Lake Visions proposal? is examined and rather than just the odd consultation but their whole proposal that they'd obviously put so much work into and that is a complete proposal already so could that be examined in the same yes. way i'm just going to give the leader of the council opportunity to respond to the questions he's just heard uh, okay, um, in, in no particular order. Yeah, there is, there is an important debate at the moment about um, building houses and where you build them. Um, our policy is very clear, brownfield sites first, and um, we are, I mean, I'm a councillor for Birkenhead and Tranmere, and I can assure you uh, we are lucky, we are building houses in Birkenhead as we speak, certainly in my ward. We're at Waters, uh, there are pr proposals uh, that will be coming forward shortly for, for building houses. My um, observation about government policy on housing is um, they're intending to impose top-down targets on local authorities, well, I, which I believe will put even more pressure on the Green Belt. I do believe green, the Green Belt is, is our jewel in the crown, and it should only be, it should only be developed on as a last resort, that's, yeah. that's my view, yeah. uh, as a last resort, yeah. but brownfield sites, yeah. brownfield sites should come first, yeah. uh, but if there's a compelling case for looking at a development like this, I think we, we have got to look at it, 
Um, we are building, you know, just to, to give you an insight, um, we are building, uh, we will be build 3,000 new houses by 2020. It's one of our pledges in the world plan. But the, the reason why we can't um, build why, uh, larger numbers of, of houses is we haven't got the funding. You know, the government have cut our funding um, by 150 million in the last, in the last um, uh, 10 years. We simply do not have the capital funding to do everything that I'd like to do. Would, would I like life to be different? Would I like millions of pounds to be put in my coffers to do things ourselves as the council? Yes, but I just don't have that money. So we've got to think of more innovative and creative ways of bringing additional funding into the council. In terms of this project, um, the indicative figures that we've looked at, we'll, we will get a, an annual income, the council will get an annual income of about a million pounds in business rates and council tax receipts. And that money will be ploughed back into frontline public services. Um, in terms of uh, um, the, the lady's question, yes, we will absolutely talk to Hoylake Village Life. I've given that commitment to Mark this morning. I'm very happy to, uh, to meet Mark at any time and to look at the proposals he's put forward in more detail. Okay, thank you. Right, the young man with the hand up here. Do you want to give you a shout out, Rob? I'll try. Yeah. Couple of things. 16 year olds do not play golf. So why do you expect in a 20, 30 years time that this becomes successful? <coughs> because slowly it'll decline the amount of people who play golf and it'll be pointless to build. And the second thing, stop blaming your budget because you need to start blaming yourself and your own council. And once you get that money, you'll still be blaming your funding and not yourself. <laughs> the gentleman in the orange, the orange t shirt, and then I'll come to you, madam, with your, your hand up there and sitting down. It's really a question for the council on the funding of it. This week, West Kirby Today reported the plan detailing the funding options being proposed and indicates the returns the council could expect to see through leveraging its assets and covenant strength. That's not normal Hoylake language, but to my mind, leveraging your assets and covenant strength is only relevant if you're borrowing. Is the council going to be borrowing to invest in this development? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to Phil once we've taken a few more questions. Yes, madam. Well, I'd like no, sorry, there's a, the one, be, one behind you. I'll come back to you in a minute. The lady. Thank you. I'm sure, I'm sure there's some more wonderful verses, but I'm also very conscious, Madam, Madam, with respect. We've got ten minutes to go, ladies and gentlemen, at the, at the most. Thank you. Yes, Madam. Yes, Madam. Excuse me, please. Please, please, we sit down now. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Please, please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Can I ask one simple question? If we're so poor for funding in our area, how come the council can afford to lend money to other councils? Okay, I'm going to put those questions to, uh, and I'll come back to you, sir. Sir Phil. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to ask David to answer the, just to say something about the borrowing um, question. But on the issue about golf is declining, um, one of the, the aspects of this uh, plan which we will need to look into more detail is it's not it's not primarily dependent on golf income there are other features that will bring visitors tourists into the to the area so it's not purely golf dependent um, and why why is the council lending money to other authorities every local authority up and down the land does this and it's very simple what you do is you're not using every penny of your budget all the time so you um, lend to other authorities, and that brings in an income, that brings in an interest back to the council, which I can reinvest 
in public services. So this is a normal treasury uh, measure that all local councils up and down the land do in order to bring in additional money to fund public services. On the borrowing one, because it's an important question, just let me ask David to answer that. Uh, thank you, Phil. Yes, in terms of this project to deliver it, it will need to borrow money to actually make it happen. Now, they can borrow from private markets, but as Councillor Davis has said, we as a council need to act more commercially in the future because of the need to be able to use that income to put into public services. So here there's an opportunity for the council to borrow money at a low interest rate and then to charge a higher interest rate for loaning that to this particular project if it goes forward. And so in the report that's been considered by members on the 18th of December, all of that information is set out there as public and what we've identified is that from the loan we would make to this project, the council will get in, in excess of over two and a half million pounds, which it then can invest in services. Now that's, sorry, now that's only if this project goes ahead when it's gone through all the other checks and balances which are set out in the report. About eight years. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very conscious of the time and I want to give our speakers an opportunity just to say their closing words as well. So I'm going to take two more questions. One from the gentleman here on the front. <coughs> yeah, so I'd just like to say that all of you here today are in a building that in 1987 I put forward a steering committee that saved this building from demolition and we did oppose the council. So what I would say, uh, the councillors is hard work, but all I ask from the councillors involved in this project is be truthful and to give a full detailed report on this de development agency because it sounds so dodgy. And I must say compliments to the presentation. Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> wonderful presentation. And Okay, just remember that, don't give up the fight. This building is here today because it took 10 years. Okay, thank you. Well, we used to live in St Albans, and St Albans as a city was destroyed in many ways because they built so many new houses. They built two new housing developments, and not the same kind of things we talked about here, that we couldn't get our children into local schools, we couldn't drive to the station, we couldn't park at the station. There's ramifications of high number of housing in such a small area as Hoylake. I think it would be totally detrimental. Um, I'm a member of the local Conservative Party, absolutely um, opposed to this on every level, and what I've heard today, I am, I am absolutely even more opposed. So I am very much into the fight. Thank you, Karen, you were fantastic, formidable, thank you. <laughs> Okay, the final question is Phil, you said earlier no decisions have been made around this project. Does that include going into partnership with James Paul Anderson and the Nicholas Joint Venture Group Limited? Are you going to be prepared to pull the plug on this partnership? Right, the next stage is we do these technical studies funded by the developers. Um, I've got an open I have got an open mind on, on what the outcome of that is. Uh, I want to see what the evidence says on all of the issues that we've talked about this morning. I don't understand how anybody uh, with an objective view would, would not want to see what all these um, uh, impact assessments